I, I just believe the best person for the job should get the job. And that's quite radical at this moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is underqualified women shouldn't be, shouldn't be in there because they're taking qualified men's jobs. But we're sending the wrong message. I think we're sending a message of be lazy, be controversial. Be a victim. Cancel people, be a victim. The, the joke you made about Fred and Rosemary West. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, knew, I knew I was going to have that response because they're so fragile, these yeah. people. As uncomfortable as it is, you have to be able to speak the truth to power. Joey, welcome to the show. You are pissing more people off than even <laughs> we are, which is an achievement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the show. Yeah. Uh, you, you've, been, you. you've been talking a lot. Uh, and we wanted to have you on to talk about, uh, you know, your life and where you come from and stuff you've been through, but also the stuff you're talking about now. You, as I say, you are uh, kind of upsetting, triggering, you might say, a lot of people because you've dared to point out that some female football pundits uh, are not perhaps their own merit. Is that yeah. fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, and I just believe the best person for the job should get the job. Um, and that's quite radical at this moment in time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I just think we send the wrong message. You know, certainly if we're, if, if we're putting people in position, not because of the skills and, and their attitude and, you know, the, the, their ability, then I just think we send a dangerous message uh, going forward and look at societies. You know, I'm only 41, but it's changed a hell of a lot in a short space of time. And I don't think it's changed for the better because of, you know, kind of DI and inclusion I'm, I'm all for it i think when i look into sports teams you know any team i've been a part of the more varied the better but it is underpinned on on, on merit you know we need the best right back for the team <laughs> you know we need the best left midfielder for the team to make the team function not you know quota quotas and and, and boxes to tick and you know sport is is the ultimate meritocracy isn't it mm -hmm. you know another the doping and the financial doping and all the other stuff that goes on uh, off off the pitch, but on the pitch, sport is you know, certainly football is is a, is a true meritocracy. I think that's why people love sport because it, at least they have the idea that this is like one of the few places in life where you're either good or you're not, you're either performing or you're not. Uh, and I'm curious because you must have known that saying what you're saying is going to get is going to make it difficult for you to work in football. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. Is that <laughs> yeah. fair to say? Well, I knew I was burning in the boats. Yeah. So it's the, you know, that was... And, and why have you decided to speak up? I mean, let's be honest, you've always been a bit of a troublemaker, mm -hmm. one oh, way or absolutely, another. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, why have I, I didn't decide to speak out. It, it just kind of came out. Um, I, st I, I got sacked the Bristol Rovers. Um, we were taken over by a couple of Kuwaiti investors, quite different principles, culture, just not aligned principally with, with the way I see the world, you know, tried divide and conquer strategy relatively early. And at that point, I'm like, okay, this is uh, this is not for me. I'm away from my family. I've been down at Bristol two and a half years to ch change the club's uh, culture. And then coming out of the management space, I knew with this women's commentating in football issue, I knew it was frustrating a, l a lot of people. Certainly when I'm watching it, I'm like, because I'm, I'm listening to the, the technical nuances and knowing how incorrect they are. Like I watched a game at the weekend. I, sh I shouldn't um, um, keep banging on about it, but I watch a game at the weekend, the Everton game, and I'm on the dodgy box, you know, the, so I can watch all the streams from all different countries. It's the only way, you know, you can get, <laughs> it's the only way you can get football, you know, live football at yeah. three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. You can't get it in our country, and yet all the other countries got on. So I'm watching Everton Luton because for me sins, I'm an Evertonian at the, in the FA Cup, and the first the first goal that Luton score is a foul. Like it's just it's just if you know what you're looking at, it's it's a foul. So to get the goal, you've got the male commentator and the female co-commentator. I believe the co-commentator's role has to be expert. I think they have to have spent a long time either playing the game or time served in the game to give that nuance, the the expertise to to the audience. You know, if I'm a young kid out there listening, I want I I want to I want to know what's happening so I can apply that to my game. And they miss it and they get it wrong. And then the, the male, the female co-coms is talking about something else entirely. She gets a goal, so got it wrong. When they show multiple replay plays, then you then see Ross Barkley push Calvert-Lewin in the back blatantly. And, it, and it, that little nudge is the difference between Dominic heading the ball in the, in the front post and not. 
after about the fourth or fifth replay where she should be now saying, look, VAR should intervene and uh, disallow this goal. She then says, oh, it's really clever. I'm just, like, I'm just infuriated watching the telly. Like, God. And I'm not that, I'm not a mad football fan anymore because I played the game. Once you play the game, being a, a died in the wolf fan goes because you're a mercenary, you're a gun for hire. You know, I've played against Everton as a Newcastle player, Man City player, and we've scored goals and I've celebrated them and I've been desperate to beat them. So I can't no longer claim to be a true Evertonian because I don't want Everton to win above anything else. Um, and for me, the difficulty lies in if I was watching the golf, I'm a keen golfer or the UFC or the boxing, and the person who was in the co-coms role or the pundit role was given the wrong information, then that would that would give me nonsense. I wouldn't be getting the you know stuff I could apply to my game or stuff I could uh, really interpret and use in me in me in, in my boxing career or whatever or MMA career. And the fact that this is going on on every single media platform and it's going on unchecked because people are either listening to people make mistakes and fearful of pulling them up on it for the reprisals or given, you know, you've seen a few guys, I think in, I've seen Jensen Button doing a few times in the Formula Ones where, where he looks at the, I think it's Danica Stewart or Patrick, is it? And he's just like, she's talking about something to do with the driving and you can see he's just like, what the fuck? You know? <laughs> <laughs> what is Checo supposed to do? He couldn't just lift off before the corner and pull him behind because looking at that, there were cars there. So they would have had the opportunity to dive down the outside of him and cause mayhem, you know. So it's, it's a tricky one, but it's when you get to that point of deciding, well, I'm going to turn in now, but I need to give them room. Maybe I just run off track a bit and come back on. I think he should have. I think he should have lifted and pulled in a bit next to Carlos and then two by two. And just, it's still a good start. The problem is lifting as well it causes accidents. So you can't just suddenly lift because in an F1 car, when you lift, there's so much drag that it, it does slow you down very quickly. And the guys behind get affected by that. Fair. And it just, just funnel, it goes all the way back. Fair, to the I guys haven't driven one, so fair. <laughs> you know, he's obviously been an elite level yeah. driver and and it's just like, and, and I think we want to see a decrease in misogyny, a decrease in racism, a decrease in sexism. And, and that is the whole purpose of DEI, you know, bringing down these barriers. But when they force it on you and, and they force it on you and, and it's poor quality, poor journalistic standards, then you get a rise in everything it was meant to defeat in. <laughs> so it becomes, it just becomes absurd. I, I agree with you. It's a good point, Joey. I think what I would say, and a lot as someone who is a football fan, when you listen to the cold comms role, and even people who played at the elite level, frequently the standard is pretty crap as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the males. Like I, I'm, I'm watching lots of mail. I, mm. I, you know, th this has ended up being a bit of a, of, of, of a volcano because if you can't say anything now about certain groups or people who've put themselves in certain groups. There's a lot of poor male commentators out there, really poor co-coms, pundits as well. The problem with them guys is they've actually got equity. They've got credibility. They've, they've mm. played the game. And as stupid as their opinions can be, they're doing it from a, from a knowledgeable position of, of experienced, uh, you know, the, the intensity or the speed at which the game moves at or the physicality or they've experienced it. And again, you know, good, bad and indifferent in, in all. The problem I have with the women ex-players is they have no experience of it. You know, in, in, in essence, it's pretty much a different sport. I know they'll argue it's the same rules, it's the same sport. I'm like, you know, we have to accept that women's cricket and men's cricket ain't the same. You know, same with rugby, women's rugby and men's rugby. Now, I prefer, if I watch the tennis, I prefer to watch the women's tennis. Firstly, they're better looking than the men. <laughs> Secondly, the, the, the rallies last longer. You know, the men's game's pretty much power, serve, ace, bang, you know. I prefer the women's golf sometimes to the male golf mm. because they hit the ball. So if they're playing a course I've played, mm. they hit some of the shots that I can hit. The men don't. <laughs> they just hit it like a hundred yards yeah. further. So I can't relate to it. Mm. You know, so when I watch women's, I'm not against women's sports. I think women's football's done fantastic in our country. You know, I've never seen more of it on TV. You know, there's, you know, they've seen Trafalgar Square. I couldn't get into Trafalgar Square for the Lionesses final. So it's great. But men and women's football, like if, if I, as an ex-player, I watch women's football, uh, trying to be as kind as I can to it, but it's just not very good.
I, look, I, I agree with compared you. Compared to men's. Yeah, yeah, well, compared to men's. You look at like the elite level Champions League, for instance. It, it in does, the women's game? No, no, in the women's game. It's nowhere near close. When you get to that elite level of male game, they, they, they just can't compete. The reason that I find you funny on Twitter, Joey, is you do like being provocative, mate. You do yeah. like making a joke. And it is funny seeing people have a meltdown. For instance, the, uh, the, the joke you made about... Um, Fred and Rosemary West. Yeah. That is... <laughs> no, see, I, knew, I knew I was going to have that response because they're so... They're so fragile, these yeah. people. Like, like, I don't know whether this is a blessing or a curse. I've had that much abuse in football stadiums yeah. and you can imagine the articles written about me in the commentaries yeah. and people passing comment and stuff I've done or said that you just develop a bit of a thicker skin. Yeah. You know, and I, when you've had as much said to me as, as what I have... Mm -hmm. In the end, you realise it's it's me who's taking offence to it. Yeah. You actually can't offend me. You know, it's not possible for you to offend me. I have to, at some level, let you in to to be offended. So me and Black used to work on this thing of visualising. And, and the only time I done Constantine, the only time I done the Vim off breathing every single morning was in the Burnley promotion the year we won the league. I religiously used to get up and do it every morning. I've never felt clearer. You know, that was a great working environment that the, the manager built there. And for me, in, in, in terms of, um, you know, provoking people, Blackie, we, we would talk about stepping into this, like, like almost like a, you know, a bubble of strength. And no one, we're not going to let anyone in, the opposition players, the opposition fans, the referee, we're not. And if we choose to open the door and interact with it, then, but we know what, so I asked. To, I worked on this kind of visualization concept. I didn't get sent off that year. Lowest number of bookings, mm -hmm. team of the year. So there was a few factors. Vim off and and some of the stuff. We, me and just Blackie for people, were doing. we were talking before about Wim Hof breathing. Wim Hof breathing. And yeah. your mentor is a mentor. Steve Black. Yeah. Steve Black. Yeah. Yeah. Who's you know, who made a big difference yeah. in, in your so, career. So your life. in terms of, I then moved that concept further out in terms of like words and offence and you know, I, I, I've I've used it. I think to benefit my life because, you know, you can be offended every time you open the curtains if you want to be. You know, I find it bizarre that people follow me on Twitter or X as it's now called and get offended at what I'm putting out there when no one asked you to be here. No, now, I also now have worked out because I've been in Twitter a long period of time, although I haven't used it, but I've always kind of monitored what's going on. And I do think it's got nuts. Oh yeah, um, it, lots. But if you use it, for what it is, a tool you can you can use it for benefit as as, as we clearly have, um, and I just figured out I can't be I can't why am I taking offence to that just just block it out. It's the same way if I came in here and I would call you a fat bastard. You'd be like, well, I'm not fat, so you wouldn't get offended by it. You only get offended if there's an element of truth in it, or the more close to the truth it is, the more it clearly offends or triggers people, as we want to call it. And you know, I'm, I, I've just got to the point where I'm actually. You know, I'm not trying to cause anyone any offence, like purposely want to make people upset or unhappy. But if me just saying, like, basic truths is going to trigger you to make you unhappy, then fuck you, you know? Do you know what's interesting is, like, I'm actually not that big a football fan. The, the boys here at the studio are much more so than, than ever. But when I watch some of the stuff that you're saying and then I look at the stuff you're talking about, it's hard to argue with what you're saying. And when I talk to people who are not in the media space, just normal people, I'm look, people can agree or disagree with your opinion about female pundits, but most people in the country actually do share that opinion, men and women, by the way. They, yeah. they, they just do. Yeah. And, and again, I, I, I see the feedback. I have never had positivity or feedback positively on, on the stuff I've talked about over the years as much as, as this. So this has clearly hit a nerve. The fact that was still, it was a month, about a month ago, I, I tweeted about, you know, let's be serious here, the women shouldn't have any authority in the men's game. Like, and, and I'll, I'm prepared to sit in front of any ex-woman player, anyone wants to have a chat about, a, but yet they just keep attacking the messenger, not the message. Um, and, and even Emma Hayes, I, I went to the Leeds in Sport Conference, Emma spoke there, she's seen as the best woman manager in the WSL, you know, she could be the crossover. I know there was a, a lady who stood in last night in the Bundesliga for Union Berlin and they won 1-0 because the manager got suspended for, I think, pushing Leroy Sane in the face, so he got a three-game, five-game, eight-game ban, something like that. And a lady, his assistant manager's a lady, she stepped in, they won one. So, obviously, 
you know, they, they can manage in the women's. I'm not saying they can, women can manage in the men's game. I'm not. Mm. Uh, I think playing in the men's game would be a hell of a lot harder for them. Mm. But men going the other way, which is inevitable if they if they don't um, if they don't change the law, because it's only a 12 month cooling off period. I looked into it because I thought I might just fucking poke the box. <laughs> Entirely, I'm, you know, I'm fairly, fairly overweight now for for what I was when I played. I'm 41, but I still think I could be Erling Haaland next season in the WSL. With the, <laughs> even if I have testosterone um, suppressors, no danger. I'm just bigger, stronger, faster. You know, they would they wouldn't be able to deal with that. But then also that the brain, you know, the little nudges, the new, the dark arts, the the stuff that. Um, you know, would be very, very easy for me to apply in in the WSL and be very, very successful. And then they would be fucked, wouldn't they? Because they couldn't attack me. If I woke up and I said, I'm Josephine Barton and I'm playing in WSL <laughs> next year, well, now they've got a... They can't write negative articles about me. Yeah. You know, it, 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 we, you know uh, it's uh, a good uh, move right. in many ways. Yeah, it is, it is. But then when you're running by your kids, I'm like, shall I just piss these off completely? And they're like, Dad, don't we? You know, <laughs> this is the last thing we need uh, so if I didn't have kids, I would, I would, I would be tempted just to poke the box, almost to say, "Look, this is how absurd your position is." But then, you know, you don't want to make fun of what is a serious topic, you know, serious conversation. And I'm just seeing now, um, obviously, the swimmer in in America is trying to get in the Olympics. Leah right? Thomas. Yeah, Leah Thomas. And then you've had um, obviously the woman golfer, mm. uh, the, the the man golfer win the women's golf. Um, We've but, covered this issue a fair bit on the show because it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the problem: is it's it's. It, I'm just like okay, objectively, in a thousand years, so you're going to bury this person. It's got all these sport and achievements on the gravestone. What a yeah. great you know, women's champion golf. Bang, 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 bang. And then they do a DNA, and they're like, these must have been stupid because that's a dude. <laughs> <in> the, <laughs> right, they, 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 they did not know the difference between. Yeah. And, 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 and again, if we can't agree on simple things like, you know, the basics, then we've got no, no chance of solving the really complex stuff that we've clearly got to get through if, if we're going to survive on the planet for another 500 years. I mean, we'd be fortunate at, at this rate. Joey, do you think it's quite bizarre almost? Because like you said, football is in many ways the ultimate meritocracy. It doesn't matter who your dad is. It doesn't matter how, uh, your background, what colour you are, blah, blah, blah. You can either do it or you can't, and it's pure meritocracy. And then on the other side, you've got this. I mean, it's it's utterly bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it is. It is strange, isn't it? Because you know, as I say, most sport is is meritocracy. The best person who gives you the best chance of winning gets the jersey. Um, which I think is not a right. It's not radical. It's just common common sense. I'm like, yeah, you want the best people. We know that diversification, I read a book called Teams of Teams by uh, General Stanley McChrystal, and they talk about, you know, diversity is massive in, in, in terms of it does help you, you know, get different perspectives, different, and we know it, it leads to better performance. But diversity for diversity's sake or equality for, you know, equality's yeah. sake, it's, uh, inclusion for inclusion's sake is bizarre. You know, the, the, the highlight of this being the current, uh, she follows me actually, we were with this, um, I don't know if it's a real person, but has been um, taking Mark Cuban on um, about, you know, saying Dallas Mavericks should have. She wants to play for the Dallas Mavericks because they haven't got a Chinese, uh, five foot two Chinese girl in the team, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you've got in your other businesses. And she, I, th I think it's somebody's parody account, but I think it's got quite big traction. It's, and she's still, Cubans actually was interacting with her for a bit yeah. and has then blocked her, blocked her, <laughs> so it's gone. But again, you know, the, the message we we got to send to people is work hard, be as be a, be as diligent as you can in, in upgrading your skills, and and if you do that and you and you put the time and effort in, you will get rewarded and you will get on. But we're sending the wrong message. I think we're sending the message of be lazy, be controversial, mm -hmm. um, be a victim, cancel people, be a victim, and what would that just? I just think we're just it's just gonna society's just gonna spiral off the back of it, and you know I think I think we've. I do think we've gone past kind of that peak wokeness. When I'm watching the States now, um, I've been, you know, I always watch the American kind of uh, culture because it ends up in some form of fashion by the weird osmosis of, tele of television, you know, uh, uh, um, ruining our society. When I look at the, you know, the, the message the Kardashians send to young girls, I mean, it's just so, so dangerous. I think that the worst kind of people, you know, change your body, you're not good enough. Alter yourself. You, you know that. You, you, you know and these girls look up to them. You know if they release a a mascara, tens of millions of these young 
kids are watching it and it's over sexualized and everything, you know, basically make yourself a superstar by doing a sex tape and then exploiting everything that comes afterwards. Um, and yet they celebrate it. And I'm like, this is just, we're just sending the wrong message. You, 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 we won't realize for 20 or 30 years what the consequences of this are. And obviously Yuri Brezhov and, and the, it, it, you know, the, the stuff that they'd been saying about kind of what the Soviets were going to do to universities, we're kind of seeing, you know, that kind of, and, and I know Peterson, Jordan Peterson was talking about, you know, language a long time ago and he was really, really strong on not letting the woke take control of language and, and we're seeing why, you know, the, the crazy situation we're in now. For me, I didn't think we'd be this stupid because I, I want to work on the premise that most people are rational and most pe people are reasonable. But what I'm finding now is, and COVID for me was the big mm. change point when I was seeing people driving around in the cars with a mask on and they were the only person in the car. I'm like, <laughs> when I'm seeing people, you know, banging pots and pans and then getting locked in the house and phoning um, the authorities on the neighbors because they've had three walks today. I'm just like, where are we going? And, and it's a strange, like, I didn't get vaccinated mm. because I watched um, the, the 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 companies basically say if anything happens we're not gonna and I was I got COVID relatively early. I was just watching it unfold. I was like, it's not enough information here, you know. Mm. Anything I knew about vaccines and I kind of read a book. I should I shouldn't have read it. Really called Merchants of Doubt about the tobacco industry and how it kind of um, you know corrupted the medical industry to say smoking was great for you. And, and obviously we all now know that not to be true. And I, I just had this this. I was just like, this just isn't right. This is this can't. And I didn't want to kill anybody's gran. Mm. I didn't want to pass the infection <laughs> on as well. You know, so, you know, I ended up volunteering because we got shut down in football. Obviously, yeah. we all got stopped. So I ended up volunteering for the Royal Volunteers and, and you know, ended up doing a load of washing and getting a few messages for, for a guy who, who was living near me who obviously didn't have a washing machine and would go to the laundrette. So obviously, COVID happened. Um, and I didn't obviously want to, you know, cause any problems for society. And, and, Luckily got COVID so in early March, natural uh, fought it off. It was, was not nice, lost my sense of smell, taste for 10, 12 days. Did feel different to the flu. Yeah. No, yeah. We, we had a, a couple, two or three times and a, one of the two, one of them was really barely noticeable for me. The other two, pretty brutal. It, like yeah. it wasn't a flu. It was. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt that. Like, yeah. I, I was in yeah. the back garden. We'd been shut down for COVID and just felt really, really cold to the point where I ran a hot bath and knowing you know the bath's hot, you get in there and I felt freezing, but like steam's coming off me. So I was like, this is not right. I only felt like that for two days. Really cold, really like fluey. And then, but the smell and taste had gone. So that, why would I need a vaccine if my body had built up natural antibodies towards it? It doesn't stop you getting it. It doesn't stop you passing. Like, I'm like, and then when they were starting to say like, you know, for me, the big thing was when they started offering people in America like bacon and fries, and I was just <laughs> like, "What's going on here?" And then, luckily, I didn't, you know, didn't need to get vaccinated to carry on playing. Mm -hmm. I, I probably would have done if you'd have said to me, "You need to take this vaccine because we want to go back playing. We want to start the football season back up and get the season finished." I probably would have taken it because I'm that desperate to play football. And if the, you know, the club doctor was telling me which I think has gone on at lots of these clubs. Mm -hmm. You know, I know they've put off the, va the vaccine um, conversation until after the uh, general election, because mm -hmm. it's clearly going to go right across uh, all parties. Um, but, and, and I, I would have, you know, for the, for the pressures of our industry, I probably would have got at least one, one vaccination. You know, I've taken flu vaccines. Mm -hmm. if, I go, if I go on, you know, a Far East trip or I go to the Amazon, I would take the re required vaccines to not get, you know, the, the, the tropical diseases that are out there. So I'm not anti-vax. And by the grace of God, if there is a God, um, I didn't get injected. And at the time, my wife was pregnant with my youngest son, Etienne now, and her family were kind of in that limbo that everyone was in trying to do the right thing. And her brother got uh, vaccinated and got rushed to the hospital within 24 hours and had to get his appendix out. Just, you know, definitely as a, as a, um, in response to what, what he'd been injected with. Um, you know, these, the 91% of the UK, I think uh, that was the, what I read had been vaccinated at one dose at least. So there's a lot, we're in the minority, the people who haven't been vaccinated. <laughs> so it's no good going, ha ha ha, because you're not gonna, you're in the minority. 
And I think a lot of good people have made poor decisions because of the information that was at hand or the pressure to keep the economy moving or the jobs moving. And I don't think it's a case of going back and punishing everybody. You know, the same way I think we just have to draw a line under it. And it's easy for me to say I haven't lost a loved one. I wasn't forced to bury a loved one behind a plastic sheet or with a funeral of two or three people. I haven't had uh, COVID injuries, you know, because I never took the job, uh, the jab. So it's easy for me to say, look, I think we have to just draw a line and say, I think a lot of good people made bad decisions. You know, as, we're all subject to change when new information comes to light. And I think they tried to do the right thing in the midst of a global pandemic where the government clearly were incompetent or incapable. And everybody was trying to do the right thing to protect vulnerable people. And in the midst of that, they've done some um, irreparable damage to people's belief in, in government, to pe people's belief in um, authority, and also to, to people's... Um, bodies and families and, and some people if, if that's happened to you I'm, I'm not sure I would be able to forgive and forget but do you remember the Canadian trucker protest in 2022 where thousands of Canadians came out to protest COVID restrictions and vaccine mandates now these protests lasted for weeks and the people out on the streets needed money as any grassroots protest would so people set up online crowdfunding campaigns which raised millions of dollars it was incredible but those campaigns were closed down and the money didn't get to the protesters because the Canadian authorities started to criticize the crowdfunding platforms, ramping up pressure on them to close the campaigns. The biggest crowdfunding platform, the one we've all heard of, completely capitulated to the demands. Now, this is where our partners Gifts and Go come in. They stepped in when the other platforms backed off and raised millions of dollars for the truckers. When they were criticized and dragged through the Canadian courts, Gifts and Go came out and said, they respect diverse views and believe hope and freedom are values worth fighting for. This is why we are proud to partner with them. So if you need to crowdfund for whatever means the most to you, then don't go to the big tech platforms. Go to Give, Send, Go. Starting a campaign on Give, Send, Go is easy and intuitive. Go to GiveSendGo.com today. That's GiveSendGo.com to start raising money for whatever matters to you. The thing that I noticed as well is there was football before COVID and football after COVID. Mm. And I'm going to be honest with you, as someone who really loved football, really loved it, from the age of eight, seven, eight years old, mad keen football fan, I'm not sure I like the football after COVID. Do you know where I'm going with this? Well, VAR is more prevalent now, isn't it? So that's ruined it, hasn't it? You know, I think, I think we have to accept that. The Black Lives Matter thing was tapped on the back of that. Yeah. Don't forget we were all kneeling. I had to kneel. Because my brothers and my cousins been involved in a, in a racially one of the biggest high-profile racial murders in in the country. Imagine I'd have stood when everyone was kneeling. So I was like, they just because they write whatever they write about me anyway. So I'm like, well, for me to kneel for two seconds stops them calling me a racist because that's what they would have done. Um, and also, is if I what I felt it was is showing the black people and people of color in the um, where would you like? There's no you know you don't need you don't need to do it every single week and every single game as it kind of got hijacked. And then, then I seen people stop, players stop doing it. And I thought, well, you know, now there's no point in just carrying on doing it because there was a lot of players of colour who stopped doing it. Said, this is a load of nonsense. It's been hijacked by uh, people with nefarious purposes and, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, do the cause, you know, reducing racism, any, 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 any benefit. And I, and I do agree with you. I think it fundamentally changed us who were in the industry because the amount of shit I've had our fans over the years, home and away fans, by the way, <laughs> um, when, it, when it's going well, it's great football, but when it's not going so well, you know, the, 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 yeah. the people clearly let you know. It is in, in that regard through meritocracy. And players and fans and the wages players were getting paid and, and fans were kind of taken for granted. It was kind of like the clubs were trying to exploit fans to get as much money out of them. Payers, players were had lost the connection, you know, working class game, the players because of the salaries, certainly at the top level, and, and even cascading down, filtering down, you know, they were still earning a lot more than the average person. And I think that, being, you know, certainly for me, it was kind of like TV money was what was driving, you know, the big salaries. And it was kind of like, f f I got the feeling players were like, fuck the fans, fucking annoying mm. in the stadium. And uh, it, there was a bit of a disconnect. And then the stadiums were emptied. And I think everybody in the industry realised just how important fans in the stadium were, if, 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 if not as important uh, as the players. You know, what's the point in 
it's a Sunday league match in essence <laughs> if the fans aren't yeah. in there you know they make it and what what I think players realised in that period was how fan noise and you know the the momentum the energy that fans can can bring can lead to incredible performance that is just not reachable without the live stadium uh, audience so i think from that regard for players i think it was a really interesting reset and i think players and people in the industry really appreciated the fans in the stadium what it takes to you know to shell out your hard earned wages and travel to a stadium and support your team with the energy and i think from that regard it was really good because i think there was there was a disconnect happening mm -hmm. and i think that reset that but i do agree with you in terms of the product we came out of um yeah. you know we, we, we there's no doubt the George Floyd Black Lives Matter thing irreconcilably uh, disrupted our culture. You know, beyond, I think it had more impact than anybody's even figured out here. And it shouldn't because America is a, you know, is a completely yeah. different entity to, 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 to the UK. But then, you know, with social media and YouTube and, and all of a sudden people who are bored, who, people who are unimportant or unimpressive hijack these um, movements, you know, to add pronouns on and add, you know, whether it's Ukraine and anti, you know, whatever it is, anti-Russia or Middle East now or, you know, whatever the crusade it is. And, and the problem for them is they hijack and they, and, and, and they take so many positions that eventually, as we're seeing now in some of the communities, they end <laughs> up cannibalizing each other because although they stood on the same thing two years ago, now they're in direct competition, you know. So for me, I lowered the drawbridge you know, in football, I would I was the one who done the first interview with Amal Fashionu about uh, her uncle killing himself. Who was I think a, a gay footballer, uh, uh, Justin. No one would do it. She kept emailing me, and I'm like, go and ask one of the other. You know, the ones who'll big profiles who'll do any. You know, who should really be speaking out on this because they're of colour, and and and, and it, Justin's more aligned to them than, than me. And she just kept, no one would do it. I don't want to name the players' names, but the big profile, even today, ex-players now, but like massive media profiles, didn't want any part of it. And I said, why? She's like, well, they're fearful that they'll get homophobic abuse in the stadiums. So I'm like, well, if I get homophobic abuse in the stadiums, <laughs> that's a positive. <laughs> it's a positive for what I'm getting. So, and, and also my uncle Tom's gay and he was one of my heroes growing up and I didn't know he was gay till I was like 19 or 20. And it wasn't, it, at that point, it wasn't okay to be gay in the no. 80s and 90s. Certainly in rural working class, like uh, offsprings of, of Liverpool, yeah. you know, yeah. so, you know. But Joe, then, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm just going to, so yeah. what I was going to say to you then is, so I got asked to do this interview. Yeah. I didn't want to do it because it's, like, it's not my course. Yeah. I've got a gay uncle, but it's not to do with me. She couldn't get anyone to do it. So I, I said to her, look, I'll do it for you I'll do, because I'm not bothered about anyone saying I'm gay. And the off spin of that, uh, I think it was for the BBC or whatever she did of it. The off spin of that was Paddy Power and Stonewall came to me and said, look, we've got this idea for rainbow laces. You, we've seen you do that. Would, would you be up? And so I was like, okay, what is this? And, and, and so I ended up being the first person to wear rainbow laces and got all sort of, some of my teammates to do it. And now it's become the Premier League's, it's taken on by them. They never, you know, when they put so my CV out there, they all never <laughs> mentioned me. Yeah, because that would give me credit, you know, so yeah. they don't want to give me, you know, it's like, let's just call him a bastard for all those things, but let's not, uh, you know, shine light on the, on the stuff he's used his profile for positive for. So, so I end up do, do that. That's become a big thing now. So I actually lowered the drawbridge because I was like, if there's got a, one in ten men are gay, how many professional footballers is in the UK? Law of averages, like just just logic, would says to you, there's got to be some lads in the dressing room. I know for a, for a fact I've played with with three or four, but they couldn't. They, they weren't out. They couldn't come out publicly. Why not, Joey? I just think for the abuse that you would get in a football stadium, you know, because like anything, you know, you've seen it with. Did you see the clip going online yesterday about the guy who's doing BBC Radio Wales from the Newport Man United game, and he's saying. Oh, this is great. The fans are singing Anthony's the greatest, you know, the Brazilian winger. Yeah. And when he's, he goes, can you not hear it? And as he slows it down, you can clearly hear them singing Anthony's a rapist, <laughs> <laughs> which he's been accused of in, yeah. in, in Brazil. Anthony's the greatest is the latest chant from the... Oh, oh no, it's not greatest, sorry. Uh, apologies, if you understand that. And then he realises, but obviously it's just brilliance in terms of he actually has thought the fans yeah. were singing there. Because again, football stadiums, you know, you misbehave. 
You can't tell 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 drunken football fans what to sing and what not to sing or what to play. So if, if you think about football, it's concept, it's, it's a working class game. So we still have a huge class system in this country, I think, and I see it every single day when I watch, and I see it especially now when I watch the Guardian journalist attack me. Mm -hmm. Guardian that was once an ally of mine, been in the offices when I was talking about um, you know, quote Nietzsche and I was mm -hmm. going to art galleries and I was talking about Rembrandt. The Guardian were all over me when I was doing Stonewall and Rainbow. The Guardian could, you know, I could have got my own uh, opinion column in there, no problem. Mm. And then all of a sudden I take this position of, um, the, the class is right wing. I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I suppose if you're that far left, anything's right, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, you know, you know, take take the position as uh, said my truth about what I feel about the female uh, standard of commentary in, in the men's game, and also that it's it's taken men with credi credibility and equities jobs. That's what they're forgetting. Yeah. You know, a lot of white, and I don't want to be a victim here and play into thin has it, but a lot of white ex players are no longer a viable option because it's not politically correct to have them on the TV. Really? So in the industry now, if you're an ex-player who's a white male of a certain yeah, age, you just wouldn't get well, anyone near? I've had so many people reach out to me who obviously, you know, petrified to say anything because there will be ramifications of, of, of like, I'm seeing low, 90%, 95% positive in, in, in personal feedback, about 80, 20 on Twitter. Mm -hmm. you know, never agree with about 70, 30 on Instagram. Mm -hmm. They're the only kind of ones that gauge. And, and then I always think there's lots of people and I've met these people who come up to me in person. They say, I completely agree with you, but I can't say anything. If I said that, I'd get sacked by work and, and they work for like a car manufacturer like, because they're on like zero hour contracts or whatever. Or I can't say that because me, I get in a dispute with me partner or but I totally agree with you. So I'm only seeing a small kind of synopsis of, of people's real sentiments and feeling, as you're saying, you smelling it and sensing it as well. And I think, you know, it's only one thing here about female commentators in the male game, but clearly in society, in, in businesses across it, this is um, infected for the negative a lot of these other uh, industries. So, you know, I'm seeing, because I get a lot of uh, fee feedback in terms of they, they put me a lot of you know, racism, misogynist, whatever, whatever you want to call me from day to day. But they haven't actually come for me on the homophobic one. The reason they can't is because I've done the Rainbow Laces campaign. They probably will after they still attack me. Great. Um, but now what you're seeing in that community, because I interact with these because I was the first person to, to, you know, certainly in the modern era to put a, you know, to put, put my balls on the line, so to speak, to say, we should make it absolutely fine for a, to be a gay footballer. Clearly there's been thousands of them. But they haven't. We haven't made the landscape um, safe enough for them to be able to come out uh, whilst they're playing. I know Thomas Hitzelsberger and a few lads. I think there is a guy playing in the lower leagues at Blackpool mm -hmm. um, who, who, who's 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 out. But on the whole, I think a lot of people. And I think if you're a good player, I think it would be wise at the minute. Wrong, but wise at the minute for all manner of different things to to stay in the closet. Is that really true, Joey? Because, I, I look, I don't know the game as well as you, obviously, uh, but uh, it, I find it hard to imagine that in the society that we live in now, thousands of people are going to chant homophobic abuse at somebody in public. Well, you've seen someone do a monkey sign to, to a black player at Sheffield Wednesday last week. So clearly they're going to... Because they say stuff designed to hate you, so they, they'll say... Yeah. Like, the stuff they've said... To, like, I remember getting out of jail, right? Mm. Came out of jail f for assault. I had a fight in the Liverpool City Centre. My first game back was at the Emirates. I was on the bench. Kevin Keegan put me on the bench for Newcastle against uh, Arsenal. It was my reintrod reintroduction to Premier League football. So it's the, the Emirates, which is a sanitised stadium. You know, it's soft in terms of, you know, there's no oh, malevolence yeah. in that stadium. Like some this stadiums go viral, viral, <laughs> viral clip right yeah, here. soft. Like, but like look, it's a, it, it, it's a fantastic stadium. I know what you mean. It's really filled great. with graphic designers. Yeah, it's bit, it, yeah, it feels a bit manufactured and forced yeah. to try yeah. to create an atmosphere in there, which is different to the, you know, I'm old enough to have played that hybrid multiple times and really on, yeah, really narrow pitch. You know, yeah, you I can remember, feel yeah. people breathing when you're taking a throw in or a corner. You can feel, you can, you know, they can, they can touch you. These old football amphitheaters, the modern stadiums changed a little bit now. You know, obviously, you know, they've got to, they've got to ups, upgrade and I do think it's for the best. But I'm at the Emirates. As I say, not the bowling ground, not West Ham or something <laughs> where the fans are on yet. And I'm warming up. And as I'm warming up, 
this guy is just shouting abuse, abuse, abuse at me. Basically, because I've been to jail for, for assault. And he's, but he's telling me he's going to slit my throat. So he's saying to me, I'm going to slit. If I, can, if I come here, I'll slit your throat. And, and he's sitting next to his son, who must have been five, or six, seven at the time, shouting this abuse at me. And the reason he's shouting abuse at me is because I've been involved in a violent altercation. And as we talk to him, he shouts abuse. Nobody around him's checking him. Like everyone's kind of sitting there, like it's not happening. And I'm kind of like, now there's part of me, because I'm fight or flight, and I'm fight. There's part of me that's like, okay, let, let's see what this is about. Like, so I, I would always turn and meet it head on, I'd look him directly in the eyes. Because I'm like, well, if you said this to me, where you knew there was going to be a chance of, of you being held accountable, not that the fact that you're sitting in a stadium in the stand and the stewards and there's, a, there's advertising orders and about five rows of seats in between me, there's no way in the world you would be able to do what you're, what you, what you're professing that you're going to do to me if you get your hands on me. Plus, you're sitting next to your son. And like, this is meant to be a football stadium. Mm -hmm. and, and that for me is, is the absurdity of, of the world, like of football at times. You know, you cannot sanitize football stadiums. You're gonna get people shouting mad stuff because it is, it is the modern version of a church mm -hmm. in terms of people go there religiously. It's everything to them. You know, being a Liverpool fan, a Man United fan, it's everything to them. It, it, it actually makes them a success. So there's lots of people who aren't successful but support a successful team. Mm -hmm. And it, they almost become successful as a byproduct because yeah. they're a winner because they support win, winning team. Which is peculiar. It's, it's, there's, not many, there's not many sports, I think, that have the reach in the world that football has. And I think when used positively, it can be incredible. You know, you look at, I've just read a book and I don't know why. My first war I can remember was the Balkans. So I remember that being on the TV, obviously Slobodan Milosevic and, and, and all the kind of, you know, Sarajevo and the UN stepping in. And then the guy who fixed my foot was a UN uh, doctor and mm -hmm. told me some of the stories graphically, what had gone on, you know, the ethnic cleansing, nuts. Uh, and Croatian football doing well, you know, way achieved, you know, population of 5 million, producing Luka Modric, Davos Suka, Robert Prisnek, it could be. And I remember the Yugoslavian team breaking up because if you ever remember the Euros was won by Denmark who weren't yeah. in it. Yugoslavia had disbanded and Denmark took the place and ended up winning, I think in 1992. It was, yeah. The Euros, England were crapping it. Yeah. The Graham Turner, <laughs> Turner uh, period where we were terrible. We didn't make the World Cup 94. So I, my Irish uh, heritage kicked in. I became an Ireland fan <laughs> in 94 because England weren't there. Yeah. But Italia 90 was my first World Cup I can remember. But then there was two wars at the back end, if you remember there. Obviously the conflict in the Balkan states, Yugoslavia breaking up and the first Gulf War. Um, and I read a book about it and actually the war was in, it took, it started the rebellion and, and the revolution took place in the football stadiums. When you, I've got a book, Yugoslavia, politics and football, because I was like, how is this, how is this country? I wanted to know how it produced the caliber of players. Because if you look at Yugoslavia without a shadow of a doubt, would, if Croatia have got to World Cup finals and semi-finals, Yugoslavia with the talent pool it had, would have no doubt been very, very close to winning a major tournament. So, you know, they'd won, I think, the, the youth tournaments preceding and, and they, were, they, were, they were about to become a golden generation. You know, Croatia get to the, the semi-final of France, 98. And you think you add in, what is it? You've got uh, Slovenia, is it in there? Is it Slovenia, Serbia, obviously Croatia, Kosovo, Macedonia. I think it's like six countries in there. And then when you, when you know football at the level I do and you go through and you go, oh, Pandev played for Inter Milan and played for Macedonia. He would have played for that. Mm. And, uh, you know, you know, you would have had an, an incredible talent pool. And reading it for me made me realise how important football is for social debate. It's been the place you could go when the Stasi were in or when, you know, the, the, the government was not maybe how, how you wanted it in Yugoslavia and you could rebel. You could, you could, you could group together, you could share ideas, they'd, they'd go and travel to games, you know, it became quite yeah, you've revolutionary. Got fans in Iran now chanting against the yeah. regime and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, and this is the thing where we have to be careful with the sports washing. You know, one of my clubs, Newcastle, bought by the Saudis. I'm like, oh, it doesn't really, you know, <laughs> you know an ex club of mine, Man City, obviously got a nation state on it in, in, in Abu Dhabi government. It is interesting, and, isn't it? And, and because there's be that careful, contrast. Like, you know, you've got to be careful. There's a contrast between, like, what some people 
at the forefront of, let's say, sports coverage say about, you know, this signaling virtue yeah. about this mm -hmm. and that. And you, Gary so, Lineker's so, a good So example. imagine, for instance, James Milner. So mm -hmm. I see James yeah. Milner as, like, I played with Millie at Newcastle. Never drank. Drinks tea every, like, the ultimate professional. If you want to be a footballer, if, I, if I'm a manager and you say, who can I, what attitude can I take and give to all my players? It's Milner. Gets the maximum out of him. So if he's been forced to play in the Premier League and he needs to take an injection, I don't know whether he has and I haven't asked Millie yeah. this, but like so so dangerous now if he came out and said look I've had a vaccine and, and I had this reaction to it and I don't think you should get it think of the the power that would have mm -hmm. think how dangerous that is for people who don't mm -hmm. want that to be the narrative yeah so if you look at football now I heard Latisse talking I was listening to a podcast uh, with Matt on uh, 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 Michael Anthony because I'd, I'd done a podcast with him a while back in totally different energy to you two guys. <laughs> um, interesting guy. Yeah. And 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 Latisse is, is on there and he's talking about how character and like footballers now, there's just no characters. They're just very, very bland. And you get like a Marcus Rashford who goes on a, you know, does the, 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 the I think, really good to go and get the school dinners thing and, and holds the government accountable there. But it's very seldom you see them come out and have, and have a message. I do remember when I was growing up, you had kind of Robbie Fowler with the yeah. Dockers and, I think because of the way the salaries and the way clubs are now yeah. and the media control and also the, all the training these players are given, they're just robots. You know, you see interviews after the game, you can almost verbatim kind of predict what they're going to say, can't you? You know, you can almost, you can yeah, almost... Yeah, but Joe, this is what I was yeah, getting yeah. at, right? It's because, just, just sanitised, just boring. Um, well, right. Except it also seems to me that there are some people who are allowed to express whatever opinions yeah. they want. Mm. Do you okay. see what I'm getting yeah. at? I mean, you're so like Gary Lineker about, yeah. is a good example yeah. of this, right? Because this is someone who expresses quite a lot of opinions that to a lot of people in the country are c c wrong or controversial yeah. or whatever. But it just seems like when you say what you say about female pundits or whatever, mm -hmm. shock, horror, outrage, etc., Gary Lineker can say whatever he wants while working for the national broadcaster. Yeah, I, I, and again, uh, you do, you know, and I know there's people within the, the industry that kind of find that. Uh, absurd but then it's, it's about power isn't it really when you think about it so judging from the outside I don't know it looks like Gary's had a coup d'etat he pretty much does what he wants at the BBC mm -hmm. because he's, he's probably got them by the short and curlies you know if you don't do this I'll piss off and work for CBS or I'll go and work for Al Jazeera or I'll go and work for the highest bid at Amazon or whatever so he, he's obviously in a position where they're petrified of losing him um, and again you know you I know a bit more about that that character and kind of what they get up to, and and if people actually knew the truth about what he get what he's done and what he gets up to, it wouldn't last five minutes, you know, with oh, the really? virtue signaling. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, like despicable. Uh, and then to say the stuff he says, I'm like. But that's yeah. a lot of these people, Joey, because you know Jordan Henderson, you know, he was an LGBTQ role model coming out and you know talking about acceptance and whatever else. Saudis wave a 350 grand a week tax-free salary in his face and he's see you later boys <laughs> I'm off to I'm off to Saudi Arabia yeah I, and I, I look at I mean you have I, to be I careful would take that deal. Truth, <laughs> I would <laughs> fucking take that deal yeah. not well, well again lie. you have to be careful telling the truth because you know you can be principal and stand for something but again it's out the window if if you take the the the, the biggest bundle of cash isn't it you know so yeah. so again you know do you think he's a bad person no because if someone offers you that I mean he's it's not lasted long as he's on his way no. back or he's gone to Ajax now. So, you know, most people are virtuous until enough money's put in front of the face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll get you back to the interview in a minute. But first, let me recommend an incredible alternative to coffee that will give you that all-day energy without the jitters in a delicious hot drink. Mud water is made with four functional mushrooms. Don't make things out of dysfunctional mushrooms and only a fraction of the caffeine you'll find in a cup of coffee. So you'll get that natural energy without the crash. Each ingredient was added for a purpose. Cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and hot chocolate-like flavor, lion's mane for focus, cordyceps to promote natural energy, and both chaga and reishi to support a healthy immune system. It's quality stuff and tastes like cacao and chai had a baby. Why you'd want to drink a baby is anyone's guess, but there we are. 
Plus, it's Whole30 approved, 100% USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. So not only does it taste great, you can also give it to your woke mates. Right now, you can save $20, plus get a free sample of creamer and a free frother by going to the link in the description below or heading to mudwtr.com slash trigonometry. That's mudwtr.com slash trigonometry to save $20 on your subscription and claim your freebies. And now, back to the show. For me, I, I, I'm lucky and I, I don't value money. I have no, like, it doesn't make me happy. And I've only, only know that because I've not had it and had it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's easy, life's well easier if you've got it. Like, I'd rather have it than not have it, if, if, you know, so I can't ever begrudge anybody, but it can't be why you do what you do. Like, I made one move in my career for money and I hated it. Which hated one? every moment, moment of it. QPR, and I've been vocal, and, and a lot of the QPR fans don't like me because I've said I only signed for the club because of the contract there and, and, I, and I didn't enjoy my time there because I knew I joined for the wrong reasons. It wasn't I didn't like the club or the people. Like, and I had a great moment with winning a playoff final in the last minute when we were down to 10 men. Stuff, 85 hours, and I'll never forget. Like life affirming moments and always look to that club positively. But because I was honest and I said, I, I, I signed for the money. You know, I, I was leaving Newcastle and I fell out with Mike Ashley, the owner there, and, and I went to the highest bidder. Sorry, I'm a mercenary. Like, you know, at that point I was 30. You know, you, I know I haven't got 10, 15 years left. I know I'm 35, 36, whatever. You know, it's very ageist, my sport, unfortunately. Um, very ableist as well. Once your body fails, <laughs> yeah, you're gone. You know, as much as I'd like to stay there for another 10 or 15 years. I'm hoping with D, if this DI continues, you have to go for an old grey haired white person in no, your I team. No, I don't think I that's ever going to happen, Joe. <laughs> you're going to have to wear like seven years. No, well, I'm, well, I'm in the category now of, uh, as they say, and I, we'll get back to it, of uh, white, male, and stale. Yeah. So, as I said to you, when I'd said what I'd said about the women, lots of ex players, lots of ex media personalities have reached out to me and said, look, you can't quote me on this, but this is the landscape, this is what's going on. You know, behind the cameras, there's no DI. All the people who are producers, executive producers, financially uh, beneficial jobs are all white. They're all, yeah. But everyone in front of the camera or where it matters have obviously, they're petrified now because of the George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, yeah. all the marches. And they're petrified that the woke mob turn on them and then shut them down. And if, if they're, in, they're like, how do we defend our ivory tower? Right, let's, let's, let's diversify in front of the... Um, and, all the people who've got equity, who've, who've been in our organisation and, 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 and done great work for years now are gone because this doesn't fit the public uh, face and arm of, of our corporation. And for me, I'm just like, every time you turn the TV on, I'm like, fucking hell. Like, so, so what it's done, and this is the bad, the bad thing for me, I'm driving, <laughs> I shouldn't say this out loud, but I, I end up, in the house and I'm unemployed at the minute, so you obviously do a lot of daytime yeah. TV surfing. So I'm watching some documentary finishes and I flick over and I don't know why I like this, but every now and again, if the bowls is on, you know, the crown yeah, green yeah. bowls, I find myself watching it. I don't know why, I, I find it incredible. Unemployment like, will I've, do that yeah, to you, Joe. Well, no, no, I've played, every, a lot of pubs by ours used yeah. to have a crown green bowling yeah. uh, thing in the back garden. So, and there was a couple of lads in our road who, whose dad played crown green bowls. So, I wasn't into crown green balls. There was one in our park, um, but we used to use it for football, which obviously wasn't great for the, <laughs> for the because it was the best surface. Oh yeah, you know, we only had trainers on. We didn't wear boots on or anything, but I've, we would get chased off by the by the park keeper if he'd seen us on there. But we would play on it, and and every now and again, my mate would bring us balls, and you'd have a game, and it is actually a fascinating game if you can if you if you play it. Only after an hour, you wouldn't want to play as a career. I wouldn't certainly, any, you know, so. I end up flicking over and I'm watching the bowls and there was a woman co-coms on the bowls, okay? And I start thinking to myself, all these women are in football and they're usually wrong. So I wonder if there's a bowling ex-player like me who's played bowls for years, who's now sitting in front of the telly <laughs> going mad because she is technically incorrect in, in her analysis of the crown green bowls. And then I was driving yesterday and um, I, uh, was it yesterday or Saturday? And I flicked Radio 5 on to try and get the footy commentary on. And it wasn't. It was the netball. Um, New Zealand against England was on the live commentary. 
which you can imagine it was quite riveting for a radio commentary. <laughs> and it was two female comms and co-coms. Yeah. But as they were talking, I was the same. I was like, these could be waffling shite here. I, I, I've no longer any trust in other sports female commentary because I feel the ones we've got in the sport that I'm, 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 I'm known for, I've got credibility in. If, if we work on Preto's law of 80-20, 80% of the time, the poor or incorrect, there is some good women pundits out there. Not denying that, but we've got overkill now. There's too many and, and lots of them aren't good and you can't remove them because if they come with a couple of box six and they play certain cards, which lots of them do, they're actually really, really difficult to remove because they sue you and they go down all the, you know, you've seen with Eni who's sued me, suing me, she's joined with Jeremy Vines lawyers to sue me, so I got a letter. They kindly sent me a message on Instagram to tell me I was going to get it, which is obviously... Uh, what, a lawyer's contact? So Jeremy, you sue, so Jeremy sued me for bike nonce, saying I'm, I'm calling him a paedophile or whatever, and I'm not. I'm like, no, for me, noncing about on a bike with a camera on your helmet, trying to get people <laughs> points. He's on his phone at traffic. <laughs> He's a peculiar way to spend your day. Yeah. Um, and then he asked me to, after I first said this, I got, so, so how this happened, I, I, I wasn't planning this. I, I, I knew this would be a topic that would cause outrage women's commentary because so many people were pissed off with the standards of, and, and it was just annoying people. So I said to Noah and Josh, we we're going to launch a podcast. I said, I'll do this 15th for Jan. I'm going away on holiday. I get back about 10th for Jan. And we'll, I'll talk about it here. So that was the plan. And then I jo I've joined a snooker league to get me competitive fix with, with my mates yeah. in the winter. So we play snooker on a Wednesday and it's in the working men's clubs in and around uh, the area I'm, all ex mining villages. Mm -hmm. So it's like, one pound fifty a pint, which you, you won't understand if you're in London. <laughs> but it's like you can't spend your money in there. You know, but and it, 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 they're, they're all you know ex labour clubs or yeah. conservative clubs or like. But but the working men's clubs and Amazon were doing the games that on that Wednesday. So every game you could watch, and everyone had a different commentary team. So whilst the other lads are playing, I'm waiting for my game, I've cut the pints, and then I played, I'm like, what the fuck are you on? What are they on about? Every time, every, I've kept changing the telly over because they were that bad. Played my game, come back, and now I'm about five or six pints in, and I ended up sending that tweet because I was like, fuck, what are, they, what are these on about? Mm. Then I went to bed that night, and I got up the next day, I turned my phone off to the avalanche of wokeness attacking me, and I thought, oh, fuck, I'm, I've got two options here. I had a... So, say apologise for what I've tweeted and say I didn't really meant it I was playing snooker I had a few pints or whatever or I, I actually do mean it and fuck you which is my take <laughs> um, so my take was that Piers Morgan reaches out to me and says look do you want to come on and defend you know I'm like I'll come on no problem and I, I didn't think it was going to be what it was because he didn't tell me anybody else was coming on he said it'll be 15 minutes I'll ask you a few questions I thought it'd be quite safe because he's aligned with this anti-woke policy mm. And I go on and, and it was obviously an ambush set for me, which I, I knew, I said to Noah, this won't be straightforward. If no peers, there'll be some, there's something coming here. So I was pacing around before trying to think of the attack. What's the attack going to be? Where's it coming from? Who's it going to be? I do the first bit. And if, you, if, you're not, if you've seen the interview, after 15 minutes, he says, we're going to come back after the break and we're going to have three female ex-players. on. So I'm like, so I'm like, I'm off. I was shouting, I'm going, because he, he didn't tell me. Come back on and it was Bianca Westwood off Sky. Some other woman who had written a fucking fo football podcast or had an interest in football, uh, inconsequential, and a young girl who's an anti uh, anti feminist called Pearl Davis, who, who's online, is YouTuber. I'd never met. I don't know YouTube. I'm a 41 year old ex footballer. No, First no, no. All, listen, it, Bianca. Do you think you, that Bianca? Can I just ask you a question? And I respect your opinion massively. I respect your opinion massively. Do you mm. think the women's game and the men's game is the same game? The laws of the game are exactly the same. The same rules apply. I never you asked know, you that. Whether it's the yellow card, game. red card, same offside. Game. You can read the game. It's still exactly the same. There's two goals and 11 players play. Bianca, and you can bring have, you, have you ever been tackled at full speed? It's not about that. Have you ever been tackled at full but speed did, by a, a fully neither, grown man and, and the velocity of that that involves, the Joey, impact Joey, that involves? You that seem really to have have anything to do with it. You seem to have changed your opinion, Joey. When you were talking to Piers earlier, I'm you had a problem saying, with women who weren't qualified to talk about the game. What are you saying? Who didn't have a journalistic background to talk about the game. And now you're saying the game's different. What do you have a problem with? He's changing his mind. He's changing his mind all the time. 
Have you got a problem with the journalistic being, coverage being or have you got a problem with player, the playing of the game? Please don't all talk over each other, Bianca. Me, girls, you're just shouting at me, I can't hear you. <laughs> being a this top player a doesn't mean Let's you're going to be a top conversation. Pundit. This is becoming a farce. The first uh, Bianca comes on and she's just attacking me, just, just coming for me. It's kind of, I'm just sitting there smiling because I'm like, y y you've done my work for me. I don't even have to say anything. Like, there's going to be so many people who are now in my camp because of the stance you've taken. There was another woman they tapped on second who was trying to like get involved. She was a bit politer. So I expected Pearl to come on and she was, I was like, who's this American? She must be really smart. She's going to put a hole in me. So I'm like, what? The other two didn't really, they were just confirming why women shouldn't really be talking about football, really, <laughs> or, or certainly about the men's game. And then Pearl comes on and was, like, you aren't listening to him. And she'd actually taken the time to listen, was like, no, no, he's not saying that. He's saying, not saying women out of football, which I'm not saying, far from it. Some of the, some great friends of mine in football are women. But what I'm saying is underqualified women shouldn't be, shouldn't be in there because they're taking qualified men's jobs. And I just think that's wrong. You know, men mainly in football um, have played the game mainly. All right, there is the odd exception who've become exceptional, but on the whole, it's, it's people who've played the game. Mm -hmm. And if you put, a lot of women who play football are lesbians, to be honest. You know, it's not feminist women. It might be a bit more now because it's a bit cooler, but it's usually lesbians mm -hmm. who, who play women's games. So they're not going to have kids unless they adopt and do Madonna or Angelina Jolie and kind of do that virtue signal and one. So you're taking away men's jobs who've got equity in the game, whose careers now beyond them because the body can't do it anymore. And they're breadwinners. They usually got kids mm -hmm. to feed and families to, to, to look after. And because it doesn't fit this cool agenda of having a female on there or a person of colour on there or a homosexual on there or whatever it is or a transsexual on there, all of a sudden their earning capacity is gone and the amount of people, honest to God, ex-players, and I'm saying, would you say, and they said, can't say it publicly, Latis goes on about the, the people dropping down dead and he's contacted the PFA and FIFA Pro and he, he tells a great story about it and say way, way more cred credible than me in, in this space. And, you know, when, when, when I look at the attacks on him, He's not me. He's yeah. very well behaved. He's one of the most loyal players I've ever known. Didn't leave Southampton when he could have gone anywhere. A true individual, a Channel Islander. You know, so, so um, I found out today that they're actually called donkeys. <laughs> Weirdly, because yeah. they're that stubborn, which fits for Matt's personality. Because um, he's 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 taking a stance, and I think it's cost him his media career and further opportunities beyond that. And the amount of um, Women, I see it in, in those roles who are taking men's jobs. Now, those women are, are, must be the best of the best because mm -hmm. they're, they're on the best shows, doing the best matches, and they're not very good on the whole. Some are, but it's in the minority. They could be commentating on the women's game where they're credible. They could be building, making the mistakes that they're making on the TV in the men's game now and getting ridiculed for it and getting abuse online and having to close the profiles in the women's game. And eventually someone will go, do you know what, she's really good. Let's get on the men. And that's the way I think it should work. The cream should rise to the top. Mm -hmm. They've got enormous credibility in there. But they've got none in the men's game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely zero. And, and any man, ex-player, who tells you the women, to take, uh, women commentators or pundits are taken seriously, he's a liar. He's a liar. And, 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 and I'm telling you, there's none of them that take it serious. It's just they want to keep the job. Like You can see on the overlap all the stuff they do. But they don't think that deep down. But they're getting paid for it and they've got profile and they've got power, so you can't blame them. Gary Lineker, I don't I don't um I don't know how he gets away with what he gets away with in the BBC because it's it's obviously taxpayer, you know, through the license fee funded. But again, I would imagine that he, he just it's checks and balances, isn't it? There's no checks and balances on him. And and that was evidenced the other day when the Wayne Rooney tweet was put on by BBC Sport about the Peaky Blinders, and he came and said get it taken down and within 15 minutes it was down when you see the uh, sports personality the years well it's a joke like but when you see obviously the keeper one <laughs> when you see who's at the front and center of that there he is again you know the, the the woke diversity nonsense that you see in there it's just running amok and even when i look at ex teammates of mine who've attacked me who, who we didn't like each other when we played and when I look at the personnel who are in certain roles, it's so racist, it's untrue. And what do you mean by that, Joey? Well, it's racist because it's against white people. So mm. they're, they're excluding white people specifically because they're white. 
So if we did that, if that was done any to any other race, we got, but we go, oh, well, you know, white people have owned slaves and had to buy. And I'm like, I haven't. <laughs> like, I, I'm from Liverpool, a working class estate, Irish immigrant family. You know, I haven't owned any tobacco plantations or uh, <laughs> cotton plantations. And you know, that wasn't me. That, from what I know, they did landed aristocracy who were sitting in the Houses of Lords or in Buckingham Palace. You, you take it up with them, you know, I, I, I don't get how we've gone from, you know, 82% of the British population are white and yet we're excluding them based on the fact that they're white. What can you do about being born in Britain? Unfortunately, there's not enough sun here to get any <laughs> other shape. Like, once we exclude people on colour, it's just bad. We would never do it, um, you know, to, to any other race. I think it's fundamentally wrong to do it. And it's happening to white people and everybody's just kind of going, oh, well, you know, the white people have done some bad things in the past. I'm like, yeah, so what you can do, what the fuck you want to them now, you can pretty much just exclude them from um, having the, the opportunity to use merit and, and, and use their ability to get as far as they can in life. And I just think it's wrong, absolutely wrong at its core. I, I'm not, I, I quite agree with you, Joey. Th there's one thing that I really wanted to talk to you about, which is mindset. Okay. What makes a Premier League footballer? Why is it that some people who have the ability, I'm thinking of someone like Ravel Morrison, who was at West Ham and probably the Played most... Played at Ravel at QPR, yeah. Yeah, who was one of the most talented footballers of his generation. If That's what Rio said and lots yeah, of other mega people. Yeah, player, yeah. Really talented. Why is it someone like him never made the top? And yet there are other people who are less talented, like your Gary Neville's, who then go on and win Champions Leagues twice, leagues, etc., etc. Yeah, look, to win trophies, you've got to be at certain clubs. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only so many teams that can win a trophy at the top level. There's only so many teams that can win the Champions League. You can probably count them on two hands. Similar with when it comes to the Premier League, you might get the odd Leicester, who you know, the odd curveball team. But on the whole, pretty much all the top leagues in in all the top countries go to a certain select amount of clubs. So. To play for a certain team at the right time can mean you end up with a trophy-laden career. Or like use Latisse, for example, clearly a player capable of uh, magic, but won't have won much because he stayed at Southampton and constantly fought relegation and, and never went to, you know, join Chelsea or Tottenham or Liverpool or Man United. So, so massively decrease your chance of winning all these trophies. Like Harry Kane, prime examples, had to leave Tottenham to go and try and get the trophies he feels like he's going to need to be held in the same esteem as some of the greats that have played the game. Um, you know, playing for Bayern Munich, I, I do think is is a chance for him to cement his mm -hmm. his legacy. He obviously negates his chance of beating Shearer's uh, Premier League record, but mm -hmm. again, he, he's probably good enough player to come back at some point in the next two, three, four years and and still get to that record. I think. Um, and then what people f what people miss with footballers is addictive personalities who get addic addicted to football at a, at a young age and then dedicate everything in their life to that in terms of you know every waking moment you know remember me being in school all I'm thinking about is the training I've got to do after school finishes or the game I'm going to play in or what like I'm, the teachers talk and I'm trying to pay attention. But I'm thinking about the game I'm going to play in or training I've got that night for you know for Everton's Academy at the time or Man City's Academy. And what people miss with footballers is it takes enormous discipline over a long period. Like I sacrificed being a teenager, which is probably a good thing because there would have only been trouble or the stuff that's out there. And I look at all my close peer group I grew up with who've either been killed, killed, been involved in uh, crime at, at a high level and I've either had to leave the country or I was living in other countries now that, you know, yeah. so I go, well, that was, that was the kind of group I was in. Luckily for me, at 15, 16, my mum and dad got divorced at 14. I went to live with my grandmother, who was a lot more strict than my mum. So I was kept on a real tight leash. My brothers weren't, they stayed with my mum on the council estate and I just moved off, but was with my gran. And she would go, when I was at that age where I could have just slipped, like I'd say, I'm staying in my mates and I was going fishing or, fucking about with me mates and she got if I said I was staying in my mates she'd want to speak to my mates mother or she'd visit the house to make sure I was there which my mum never would have done and mm -hmm. loads of people's parents didn't so they could fall in the cracks of being you know 
a little bit mischievous as a youngster. I couldn't because my gran had literally, if I, if I said I was um, staying somewhere or was like coming in, she'd come and get me and pull me out of, it only happened once or twice, I've never done it again because I thought she'll <laughs> fucking drag me out and make a show me. And she'd done that to me dad, but, but it worked with me because I had something to, to get after, a, a, mm. a career. Mm. I was touching go for a long period, but something to get after. And then it was the sacrifice, you know, 16, 17, 18, people are wanting to drink, drug, experiment, girls, whatever's coming in. I knew if I did that, I wasn't going to be good enough to make it because I'd seen lots of people get in trouble with all of those vices who were talented, better players than me, and it didn't make it. Ravel, you know, would be in that category of incredible player. Play with Ravel at QPR. Strange character in terms of just being allowed to get away with lots because of his talent. He actually just needed someone really strong with him to, to show him. He didn't need a disciplinarian, but he needed someone to, to you know, I, I believe men, men need male mentors who mm -hmm. fucked up and changed their lives. Like Blackie for me was one, Peter mm -hmm. Kay from Sport yeah. and Chance Clinic, former uh, drug and alcoholic, changed my life fundamentally. Um, and when you, when you meet these older people who aren't perfect, who say, look, I've felt that and I've done that and I've fucked up and I've done actually 10 times worse than you're here, you know, I've done X. All of a sudden you you're, you realize, oh my God, like I'm not a bad person. I've just made a mistake here. And I think when we go through in the world and we try and make everyone perfect and you can't make a mistake, I just think it's really dangerous because for me, life is a series of fucking up and trying to improve, you know, mm -hmm. being prepared to fail, whether that's on your bench press, if you're trying to lift or in a race or, I think failure is very, very important and lots of failure. Obviously, you don't want catastrophic failure because, you know, you don't recover from it. But I, I think you've got to put yourself in a position to fail, you know, to, to be ridiculed. To, you know, you, it's the only way for me you make real progress. And when I look at like a Gary Neville like you spoke about, I feel like I'm going round a little bit. Gary Neville would be somebody who did everything right. Trained, slept, ate, everything right. And that increases your chances of making it. It's very, very difficult to make it because someone can tackle you and that's the end of you at 15, 16, 17, or you mightn't grow, you know, your genetic constraints might kick in or, you know, a manager mightn't fancy it, you know, in a key window where you need an opportunity to play. So it is finely balanced, but I think the people who have a fantastic attitude, like, a, a, you know, Gary Neville, would, I would say, would be, you know, like a, almost like a, a perfect, a prefect in school. He would be, <laughs> do everything he could. You know, that's not every character because sometimes, as you know, with great football, with that addictive personality comes quirkiness. You look mm -hmm. at like a Gaza, you know, clearly incredible football based on his, his, his quirky mindset, but obviously that's caused him a lot of problems in, in, in his life. And I think at someone like that, you know, Gaza probably needed a, an Alex Ferguson type role model. And everyone thinks if he decided for Man United, that'd have been different for Gaza. But then you're right to point out Ravel Morrison was under Fergie's tutelage. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of my, you know, the way I'd behaved as a younger person, where what you were actually wanting was someone to mentor you, because what mm. we're all looking for is structure and boundaries. And this is why I worry about society now. If you just let, if, you know, the evergreen mm. thing, I don't know whether yeah. you've seen this. Did you oh, see yeah. that? Yeah, 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 yeah. we've had all okay. the people yeah. on. So when, yeah. people just, when kids are telling adults what to do, I yeah. think well, the lunatics yeah. are now running the asylum. And now, remember being 20, me, I'm on a hero's journey. I've just got in the first team at Man City. I start getting into, you know, 20 to 24 is is when my world kind of changes in terms of I become what I've always dreamt of becoming and I get financially rewarded for that. And I remember the arrogance of, of, of me thinking, I fucking cracked this, I know everything. I look back at it now and think, my God, how naive and how stupid you was. But I remember the energy I had that, you know, I said I turned atheist in that period. I'm like, no, I've done all this reading and you think you know everything. Plus you're really, really motivated in terms of, you know, people go to war in them, in them age categories, you come out of university or you come out of school and whatever, and you're ready to take the world on and you think you know everything. And it's only when you're 40 or you're 30, you realize how stupid you was in your twenties. You know, you only have to look back at old photos yeah. to see the clothes you've got on, <laughs> your haircuts, etc. Yeah. Um, and, and that energy now is going unchecked because that's scaring 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds to death. And they're petrified to say anything. So now the lunatics are running the asylum. That's what we've got. And, and again, it, I do think society has broken down because people have forgotten what it's like to get slapped or punched in the face. You know, you, you do some of these radical things that these are doing and someone punches you in the face once, you don't do it again. No. Because you think, fucking hell, don't, don't fancy that. You know, 
don't agree with it, but I got hit as a kid. <laughs> you know, when I stepped out of line, I got whacked. It stopped me stepping out of the line again. Now, I I don't bring my kids up in, in, in that world, you know, because I've learned a different strategy and, you know, spoke to great mentors and read lots of books and I'm trying a different way with it and, and I want to have a different relationship with my kids. But then when I see the world that we're in, I'm like, this is probably a this is probably a factor that kids now are just going unchecked, you know, university just running over the professors. And it is this your impression of of Besmanov. Besmanov, yeah, yes. of of this um when I look at it and I don't know loads about it. I've just heard a few guys talking about it and I'm like, well no, it's what Peterson's been saying. The universities have been hijacked and these mega young really, really want to take the world on and make their stamp and change the world. People are just so confused and they're just running roughshod against everything and they're actually pulling the very institutions and the fabric of society that we need to function healthily uh, down and it's causing irreparable damage, I think, to, to some institutions. And, and if we're not careful, it, you know, I didn't think East Germany, the star, I'm always like, how oh, the mm -hmm. stars, he made the, how oh, did, did, did one third of the population, you know, opt into spying on and working for the, for the state against the people and COVID made me realize actually really, really quickly, really, really quickly, a minority can take over a majority. It was the stuff you guys were speaking about. I, I knew you heard it on the little cliff. I thought it was yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I was like, oh yeah, actually, if we don't, if we don't stand up and say our truth, and even if you get excommunicated, I'm, I've been the black sheep, so I'm cool. I'm like, listen, I'm just on the naughty step again. I've been here loads of times. And what I learned out on that step, when, when you're ostracized and you get out there because you're a bad person, all you want to do is fit in because we're quite tribal. You know, mm. we're prim primates, I believe, hierarchical chimpanzees, you know, um, Darwin's fee evolution had a huge effect on me. You know, I'm still, as I say, it made me an atheist. Dawkins, etc. cetera. Uh, Christopher Hitchens is a huge mm. uh, influence on me. But a few things have happened and I've met people and it's just kept me agnostic. Like it's just a few weird yeah. things where I'm like, hopefully, and it gives me great salvation in, at this moment because I'm like, hopefully there is something um, out there that is, has got a good, you know, if there is a heaven or whatever it is and there is a God and he's got this, ultimately he'll allow good to prevail. And when I look back across humanity and you see, you know, the Nazis get seen off, you think, what, God, what, it must have been touch and go for large periods of that early part of the 1939 uh, to, you know, my nan was born 42. It doesn't look until like 42, 43 and, and you know, when the Russians and, and get involved that it kind of goes away from uh, Hitler. But when you look at kind of history and you look at um, good prevailing, you know, I know there's been mass murder and genocide in you know, Cambodia and the Native Americans and but I, I do believe good gets through and, and you know it's the Peterson stuff of it only works if you, you can speak truth to power you know Putin for instance thought he was going to take Ukraine in what two three days because he's in a vacuum where nobody will tell him the truth for fear of the consequence you're not allowed to tell the truth to power because if the if the power doesn't like the truth that's the end here you know, Stalin, uh, you know, all these dictators or whatever, you know, over the Well, we actually past. have an episode with a historian about talking about that very we'll thing have to about get Putin. Into it, yeah, 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 Mike yeah, right, yeah. It'll come out after okay. yours, but we'll send so, it to you. Well, and I've seen you use it into world history. I didn't want to take you down. If rabbit hole guys, yeah. sorry. No, no, feel no, free to shut me up. So for me, you know, if you cannot, if you can't tr speak the truth to power, af eventually it's going to disintegrate, yep. which is what I think Putin's two and a bit years in now to a three-day war. You know, yeah. he thought the Ukrainians were going to roll over, almost like the, the French, and wave them into to Paris. <laughs> you know, and, and obviously the the, the, the adverse uh, scenario he's in now is that 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 hasn't happened, and that has ha hasn't happened because of the way he's constructed the world that he's in. Uh, you know, no one's telling them the truth, and 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 again, you know, for me, we have to. I agreed with what you said. I don't think it's perfect, our country, by the way, but when I've, I've travelled yeah. around the world and I've seen lots of places and look, we've got loads of work to do, and, but, but I think it's a, a fantastic country for, for, for many, many reasons. 
pothole and as soon as I replied to your thing, people come back at me, all the, all the things we're not doing so well, training yeah, times, yeah. pothole, yeah. and But see, people get confused about this, and you were talking about this from the personal level as well. Just because something isn't perfect or a person isn't perfect doesn't mean they're a bad person. It means they've got things they can work on. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the way I feel about the way people talk about this country and they talk about America and the West more broadly, it's like if you talked about your partner your wife, your girlfriend, in the way that people talk about their country, people would say you're an abuser yeah. Yeah. if you talk that way about your wife, right? Yeah. But, but, but we, for some reason, we're allowed, I mean, of course we're allowed to, we all have free speech. I just mean we are allowing people to get deluded about the reality of the place in which they live. And then they go out and they say all these things. That's not to say we haven't got problems. We've see, see I have to disagree with it. I don't think we've got free speech. I don't, no. honestly. I, 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 I would like to think we have, but then... You know, I've found out recently we don't. <laughs> you know, people want to sue you. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I kind of get it. But I, I've spoken to people when people have written pieces about me in the past. And I'm like, what, is this liable? And they're like, mm, well, this is how much it's going to cost. And in the end, you're like, um, what's, it's just wasted resource. And, you, you know, the only people that win in it is, is lawyers. And then when you get these lawyers of no win, no fee, kind of buzzing around, you know, looking for outrage and looking to, you know, give themselves work, I, f I find it peculiar. Um, you know, let's say, I, I do believe as uncomfortable as it is, you have to be able to speak the truth to power. And the problem we've got at this moment in time is, you know, power is just not listening. Is It's just, it's, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it's not listening to, to people. And I, I've never ever thought we'd be in a position where, you know, the government, are stealing from the people. Like the PPE stuff is just probably the tip of the iceberg if they get into it. You know, track and trace, what was that? Three billion, what the fuck was that all about? Like, you know, another two and a half billion to Ukraine. This keep going in until you, I'm like, what, what are we doing? Like the Russians, I don't agree with Putin. I do think he's a bad man, but to control a country like that, the same way with Saddam Hussein, you need bad people. You can't. I mean, I'm Russian and I really don't like Putin, but well, it's not untrue. Uh, yeah. Well, again, but you need bad people to yeah. control mm -hmm. big, massive, um, what would I call it, like ethno-diverse groups, religiously diverse groups across the... So you can't expect a nice guy to, to <laughs> hold that together. You know, now I'm... You know, Putin's the extreme example of that. You know, don't disagree with him. You have a, his, his enemies have a funny... Um, um, habit of falling, yeah. out, habit of falling yeah. out windows yeah. or blowing up in planes, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I was watching the whole Prigozhin. I'm like, you know, speaking to a couple of my pals who, who weren't with me, who were, one's an ex-SAS, SAS, and one's ex-doctor in the SBS. And I'm like, I'm back and forth with them on the wall. Like, I've never seen anything like this. Also, when the, you know, the, the, the gas pipe's getting blown up, I'm like, who's this? Who, who's, who's done this? Is this a good thing? Is, is this a bad thing? And then, you know, you... I think society has to be, it's the Peterson one again of, it's it's when really dangerous men are, are capable of it, but don't use it. Mm. Yeah. Know, there has to be a deterrent. Like, you know, you have to think if I do this, there's going to be a consequence. Now, if there's no deterrent, as Californian retail industry is finding out, <laughs> you, know, you know, there has to be a deterrent. You just say, well, we're not going to prosecute cute anyone who steals less than $950. Well, great. My dad worked as a security guard, waited to go off on a tangent mm -hmm. in, in a big supermarket chain uh, just before he retired. And he said none of the security guards would stop people who were shoplifting because they'd say, put, can you put that down? Because if they touch them, there's a completely different um, case opening up where they could be sued. So you're a you're, you're security guard in, in, a, in a supermarket chain stopping people shoplifting, but you can't go anywhere near them. Now, my dad's different. He would <laughs> stop them. And then in the end, he's like, I'm get, I, I got in trouble. So he said, well, you're asking me to stop people stealing from in the mm. shop and I'm trying to stop them. And if I, if I put my hands on them to, to take the stuff off them, I get sued. So what? Uh, and the job doesn't pay enough for... for yeah. And it's this, this is just this strange, strange uh, world of consequences for some things and yes. no consequences yeah. for exactly. other things. And yeah. it's like, okay, like, we, so it's, you know, the policing being one, you know, I've seen, you know, the kind of two-tier policing, somebody is able to shout obscenities. And then I've seen, I don't know whether you've seen this clip of the, 
looks like a volunteer police officer telling someone not to sing a church or a gospel song yesterday. No, miss, you're not allowed you are, to sing ch you uh, are. Songs, church you are. songs outside of church grounds, by the way. You're not allowed to sing church songs outside, outside of... Outside of church, or church uh, songs or uh, church grounds. You're not allowed grounds. to... That's fine, that's you're not fine. Allowed. She just said you're not allowed to sing church songs outside of church. Our church of, outside of church grounds, unless you have... A, Unless That's you've a been load authorized of no, no. by the church to do this yes. kind of song. Yeah, not saying anything anymore, thank Are you, you saying that you don't about... care about the Human Rights Act? You're lost? Hmm. So, she, you know, it's okay for certain religions to pray outside and take over spaces, and, 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 but it's not for other religions. And, and the police are policing one and arresting people and rounding them up and allowing. You know, it's it's the I mean, there was a it's the demonstrations. Was, yeah. We've seen that as with, with as well. You know, BLM demonstrations, prime example. Yeah. 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 I mean, there was a woman who was arrested for praying silently outside an abortion clinic, just like sat in yeah. her head. Can I please ask you to step away from here and step outside the exclusion zone? Well, in but you've said you're engaging in prayer, which is the offence. It's silent prayer. No, but you are still engaging in prayer. It is an offence. I disagree. Uh, you're totally right, Joey. We're running out of time. Yeah. It's been... You in the Thor police thing? If she's playing silently in her head, you are now in all well, worlds. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, and. It was really interesting talking to you. This, we could talk for another hour. <laughs> I actually was going to ask you about, you know, you've talked a lot about violence in your childhood and dealing with all of that. And obviously I'm sure it plays into the young man that you then were and stuff like that. I would have loved to talk to you about that. Maybe we'll, we'll well, come back. You and come on mine and we can uh, have Yeah, we'd love to. That'd be okay. great. Yeah. We'd love to, we'd love to do that. Yeah. But anyway, we're going to go to locals with questions from our audience in a second. But before we do, we always wrap up with the same question, which is, uh, according to you, what's the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? Oh, um, the one thing I haven't, I've spoken about a lot recently on, on certainly on Twitter, cause I'm opening up a few, uh, mm -hmm. uh, fronts in terms of, uh, the discussions for the mm -hmm. podcast later. Uh, for me, one massive one would be the kind of tax situation and how many of the, you know, big taxpayers or people who should be paying a lot of tax in this country are just avoiding it. just loopholes for the rich to get out of it. And yet, you know, I'm someone who's paid an enormous amount of tax, you know, that that's where I think, you know, the Premier League salaries going north is a great thing because 45 to 50% of them will go in tax and national insurance. You know, Haaland's on 900 grand a week. Well, that's great for the tax because you get half of that. Um, and it's, you know, your, your Starbucks, your Amazons, mm. your, your, you know, your big corporations, as well as these big wealthy guys, whether that's, you know, the Sunak uh, dynasty or the Rees Mogg dynasty, <laughs> who just blatantly are refusing to pay tax and because they've got the big chart of the accountants that they pay fi financially a lot of money to it's kind of seen as okay it, it's it's almost white collar crime but you know because it's via all these legal loopholes it, it's great and I, and I think if we actually got into the nitty-gritty of that and people paid the right amount I'm not saying they should get taxed I don't like you know I don't think any population should be taxed more than 25 percent mm. I just don't. I don't think, you know, to tax high earners more than for doing well, I, 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 I'm not necessarily down with that. But I think if, if we were to go and look at um, our tax structure, I think a lot of the uh, money we could get back from that could be utilised, well, probably not with this fucking government. They'd only probably <laughs> siphon it off into the offshore accounts um, or to the cronies uh, to buy yachts. Um, but, I, but I think... You know, the people who are profiteering from from the people of this country who are giving us McDonald's and Starbucks and fatty foods and all the problems that arise from from their profiteering. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're wrong to do it because in a capitalist structure, it's up to people, whatever they want to do. You want to eat fast food or whatever. But all the benefits that their money is making them offshore is not going into the NHS who are dealing with the problems that they're causing with you know, the products they're making a huge profit from. So for me, I think we need to get up, get hold of our tax, you know, tax, you tax the poor all the time. You know, you less driving in here, mm. like you're taxing the poor and the working all the time. What about these, you know, the rich are still getting richer like that. Yeah. We've got to gear our country towards, if you do really well out the country and you're in a few quid, you should look at it and be say, look, I'm, I'm delighted to pay me tax. I've always seen it as a badge of honor. You know, I'm a working class kid who's paying me tax. Now, there's been times where I've been offered, 
you know, and there was, and there's one of them that you should get into that's wiped out all the footballers. That's why you've seen a lot of footballers going bankrupt of the generation before mine. Because the government actually had a scheme where you could invest in the British film industry and it would obviously offset some of your tax. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and the Someone banks, offered that to us. Well, the, well, well, again, there's lots of them out there. And the banks and all that were all in cahoots with it. So they, they, all, they were all in cahoots. The government, it was HMRC regulated or backed. And then five years later, they, they went back and said, no, no, that was illegal. <laughs> Clawed the money back. Lots of players went bankrupt because they couldn't uh, pay it because they'd offset it on off the tax. And then they wanted the interest back. So I've had, I've had to pay, it was only 450 grand. I shouldn't say only. But it was only because I wasn't earning the money at the time because these were financial advisors. You know, look, I'm yeah. a working class kid. I'm not a banker or a financial you know, wizard. We were given financial advice from people who were regulated, who were trust. My bank is the Queen, was the Queen's Bank before she passed away. And HMRC. So they were telling us, this is what you should do with your money. This is the advice. And then afterwards... They changed, they changed the law and then went back when it was legal and said, no, no, we're going to... So it's like, almost like you can smoke. It's legal to smoke. So for five years, you're smoking. And then they say, right, smoking's illegal. And now we're going to... If you've smoked, you need to... And, and we're actually going to charge you interest for those uh, ciggies you had, which is just bizarre. <laughs> so lots of ex-players. So there was a... If you've seen, there's been a tsunami of players who I grew up idolising, who were, you know, household names, all bankrupt. One of the guys phoned me and there was a short list, I think, of 315 of them that they'd all banded together because they were like, this is outrageous. We've been told this was legal. Anyway, sorry to digress, but one of the things I would change was, would be we need to sort out that the people who profit here and make a lot of money in this country pay, pay the proportionate amount of tax, not because they've got the best accountants and they can afford billions to get away with it. Um, I think if we do that... I think that would be a step in, in, in the right direction, um, amongst other things. Perfect. Well, head on over to Locals where we ask Joey your questions and a few more of our own. I told Gary 10 years ago when he was giving it to me tight on match of day, and I said to him, look, if you want, all my, all my skeletons are out. They've, all mine were on CCTV and I've been to jail for them. They're out, you know, they've been on the back of the pages. All yours are still hidden. Mm. I know stuff that he doesn't want people to know. 